everyone. 9 a.m. I'm going to call this meeting to order. In the boardroom, we have uh, two commissioners in attendance and uh, three others that are on WebEx. Uh, so well, this is kind of our first go at this, especially with this many people uh, using technology. So uh, it should be an interesting uh, effort here. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order. We'll begin with a moment of silence followed by the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Makes you wonder if Mick Jagger could have everybody timed so well on his. It's rock, I know. Okay, uh, additions or corrections to the agenda? I know we, as part of the consent agenda, would be pulling item 16, uh, but uh, for the overall agenda, do you have anything, uh, Mr. Messel? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. No, and with respect to item number 16, uh, we were not able to get Army Corps of Engineer approval in time for the board meeting, so we would just ask that be, that be withdrawn. Uh, we don't know when we'll schedule it again, so it doesn't need to be tabled or postponed. We would just withdraw it. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? I'll move approval of the agenda. Motion by Dolan. I'll second. Second. Right. Seconded by Grant. Wait. Right. We'll do a roll call vote. We'll start with Danielski. Yay. Grant. Aye. Colby. Aye. Dolan. Aye. Schmeezing votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to our consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda with the uh, item 16 withdrawn? Mr. Yes. Chair, I'll move approval, Phoebe. Motion by Phoebe. Mr. Chair, I'll second, Danielowski. Second by Danielowski. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call. I'm going to try to keep the same order on the roll call votes so that people kind of know it's coming. We'll begin with Danielski. Aye. Barant. Aye. Colby. Aye. Dolan. Aye. Schmeezing votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to our announcements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the Commission, we'll talk specifically uh, about the response to the COVID-19 pandemic under your regular agenda, but just a couple of general announcements and updates for the Board. Uh, we did receive some good news yesterday for the uh, St. Cloud Regional Airport. Uh, they did receive uh, approximately $1.1 million in uh, operating grant from the Federal CARES Act uh, to continue operations. Uh, as you, you know, air traffic uh, is down to uh, really almost nothing. And so uh, those types of facilities are hurting as well as a lot of other businesses. Uh, second of all, you may have noticed as you came in, we are being able to catch up on some uh, maintenance projects. So the atrium is currently closed. They were waxing the, the terrazzo floor yesterday. So don't get too worried about the do not enter signs. It was just simply a maintenance uh, project yesterday. Uh, some good news, uh, thanks to the leadership of Michelle Ash and the county recorders, um, the state legislature did approve uh, remote license or marriage license applications last week. Uh, that was one of those uh, tasks that had to be done in person. Um, we took that as a separate bill to the legislature and they did approve it. 
Um, they have not yet moved on some of our other requests, in particular uh, birth and death certificates. Um, there is a convoluted way to do it electronically, and since the legislature doesn't seem to be moving in, uh, fairly quickly on that, we'll be using um, essentially what are called remote notaries to try to get that function done as well, simply so that we can uh, get back to business and most things can be done electronically. Um, on that note, I would just note uh, we are processing where we still have to do uh, wet signatures. We are processing those without interaction. So an example would be a plat uh, can be dropped off and then it is hand walked through the building for those wet signatures. And, and we are continuing to do that uh, where we absolutely still need wet signatures. And then finally, just to note, it appears that the legislature is uh, gearing up for, for a special session uh, sometime in June. It's anticipated that will be when the bonding bill, if any, will be taken up. And so we'll continue to work on our two bonding requests. Uh, as you know, Andrew is working the federal funding for uh, the Zimmerman overpass and we are working with the city of Becker on the uh, Becker Business Park request. And so uh, we'll continue to gear up for that special session as well. Uh, just a question on the uh, marriage license. Uh, is that part of the emergency declaration then or will that be permanent after, the, uh, after we get through this? That's a, a very good question. I actually don't know the answer. So if you'd let me research it with Michelle. Okay. Um, and we'll uh, we'll update you with that. I know the way we drafted the other requests, it was for this uh, emergency order only, but I don't know the marriage license one. Okay. Well, the, the, I, I think it's good. Some of the things that we are learning now are things that will serve us into the future, and if we just keep going with them, we'll improve efficiency, and that, that may be one of them. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. And, and the reason it was a separate bill was also because it had to go through the Judiciary Committee and it was more streamlined to go that way. But uh, I have to tell you, Senator Kiffmeyer has been amazingly helpful during this effort. So really appreciate her leadership. Oh, great. Thank you, Mary. OK. Uh, any other announcements? Any uh, announcements from other commissioners out in the hinterlands? No? OK. Uh, open forum. Do we have anyone signed up for open forum? There is nobody signed up, or Chair. Okay, we'll move on then to our 920 item, the regular agenda, and that is a Great River Regional Library update. Uh, Karen, I think what we will do is, do we have Karen somewhere? I don't see her picture here. As soon as she starts talking, she should pop Okay, up and we'll, uh, we'll allow you to go through your presentation and try not to interrupt you, and uh, we'll move on from there. So thank you. Karen, are you out there? was earlier. Mr. Chair, she shows she's buffering on her um, picture on my screen. Oh, okay. Mr. Chair, I'll text her. Oh, there she is. Karen, you're on. <laughs> we can't see her. I think, I think she's still buffering. Uh, while she's maybe trying, Keisha can try to refresh, we could go on to the second item, Mr. Chair, if you'd like. Yes, if we could. Let's go on to item two, uh, family group decision-making presentation. We'll give you a moment to uh, buffer, Jody, and then if you'll just <laughs> roll right in. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, earlier this month, the last board meeting, you um, signed a proclamation for Child Abuse Prevention Month for the month of April. And so today we wanted to highlight a program that we believe really helps us in the prevention of future child abuse, which is family group decision making. Um, we intended to have a client available today to talk about their experience with this um, in person and then by video, but unfortunately those plans did not work out. So our, we'll go on without that and our presentation may be a little abbreviated because of that today. Family group decision making is a family centered process where we really value what families have to offer um, to help provide solutions to their case. Um, historically, I think um, 
social workers really kind of directed how families should resolve their issues. And we certainly are there to be a resource, a resource and provide support. But it really doesn't take the place of families coming up with their own solutions and figuring out how they want to ensure their child's safety moving forward. Um, we can do family group at any point during a case, but we really focus on trying to do that when we believe a child is at risk of placement or right after a removal. And we want to be able to figure out how can we safely return that child home? And if we cannot safely return that child home, can we find another family member who can step in and provide that substitute care for a period of time? So in these meetings, we really um, want to help the family lead them in the decision-making process, and ultimately, if they can come up with a plan that ensures the child's safety, we want to support that plan. Right now, I'm going to introduce Andrea Danielson. Andrea's full-time position is to facilitate these meetings, and she'll tell you a little bit more about the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jody, and thank you, Mr. Chair and board members for allowing us to kind of come in and sing praises to a program that is near and dear to my heart. Thank you. Um, as Jody mentioned, Family Group is a tool within the child welfare system, um, so primarily used within our child protection investigation and ongoing children's mental or child welfare units. But we also have expanded, because we believe in this process, we have expanded it to our other units as well, including our children's mental health unit, our um, disability unit for adult and children, and we are starting to expand it into our public health unit and seeing what place it could have in our adult um, mental health and protection units as well. Um, really, I think what I value in it is that oh, thank you. Yeah. joint decision-making process. Um, thank you. That's included with it. It's how I explain it to families and when I work within the community is that it's a turn the tables on an old system. Old system used to be something happened, um, every child who went to the child protection system went to court and likely went to out-of-home placement, which we all know was very costly and very expensive and doesn't always have the best outcomes for children. So by looking at family group, we look at, we turn to the family, we turn to the support network to see how can, um, you know, we create safety for kids, have better outcomes for kids, increase safety in hopes that we don't have to go to court, we don't have to turn to more expensive solutions. So kind of that big picture idea on the families as well as on our communities in whole. Um, slide three, going into just kind of some logistics about um, family group being, uh, sorry, go back one, going into some of the best practice principles that family group goes off of. It started in Minnesota around 2000. Here at Sherburn County, we started this process in about 2002. Um, it's uh, looked differently over the years. Then in 2000, end of 2015 is when I came on board um, as a full-time position to do family group decision-making for the agency. And again, kind of what the slide says, that it really empowers families to make those decisions about the safety and well-being of their children. That's, I think, what resonates for human services as well as um, for families as well. One of the feedback that I often get from families is feeling very nervous going into this system because it is very, it's a unique process. I'm gathering together a team that I chose, not that the social worker chose for me, um, and they get to come to the table. And usually they leave with, huh, this wasn't as bad as I thought. When is our next meeting? Um, and I'll read some quotes from families that kind of also detail that as well. So. I think Jody and I have reflected on the past too that we're asking families to do really hard things. We're asking them to be very vulnerable. And as we move forward with them, they realize that sharing their secrets, you know, and hopefully in the long run, not using chemicals or abuse, things like that, do have better outcomes for families. So there's a lot of education that goes along with this process as well as we engage them in family group. Um, going to slide four. Some of the values that also resonate with me, which I think attracted me to family group, is that all families do have strengths and ability to expand on their own strengths. It's not us telling them, it's them telling the social workers. And our role as the social workers is to really help them look at what do they do well, do that more to accommodate for what their challenges are. They utilize their own resources. Um, instead of becoming dependent on the system, we want to help them utilize their own resources within their own network to become less dependent. Again, it's better outcomes for kids and a cost savings um, on the system as well. Going on with 
families, um, sorry, go back. Um, families can make well, we, we do believe that families can make well-informed decisions. And I think that's a bit of the turn the table on an old system as well. I think an old system believed that they couldn't. Family group system believes that they can. With um, sometimes some mean more education than others, but we do believe that they can make those well-informed decisions to keep their children safe and out of the child protection system. And then group, group decision-making is generally much more effective for children than making our silo decisions or individual-based decisions. So again, that theme is always kind of that group decision-making. Next slide. Um, so why do we focus on families? Kind of goes in with our values. We focus on them because of, um, it, it, one, it makes sense, but then families have the knowledge and the decisions to help themselves to get them out of their situations. Um, families feel safer and they take ownership of their plan. Like I said, kind of that turned the table. We found that over time, families were much more willing to follow their own plans if they had a chance in creating their own plans. So e increasing again, good outcomes for kids. Um, and then, you know, that strength to effectively identify and resolve their problems. I think the theme is, is that why we focus on families is the hope that it brings. I often hear from, and I don't know why this is the population that says this, but typically when I have 16 to 22 ish males in family groups, they often at the end of the meeting sit back and say, huh, if I would have had a meeting like this, or if my mom went through a meeting like this, I may have changed out differently. Things may have been different for us. I may not have been X, Y, Z in the system myself. Um, and I don't know what it is unique to that population that they are the ones that are speaking it, but probably three or four times in this past year, I've had those kind of reflection statements from them. And I think that's powerful as they look at either their younger siblings or you know, if they were a part of the team, that they have hope in this process as they move forward as well. Um, moving into the stages of family group. So family group actually has its origins in Australia, which I think is kind of neat. It um, originated within a tribe, and I don't say the name correctly, but it sounds like the Maui tribe within Australia, and they established um, within their government, they uh, went to their legislation, and this is mandatory within their government, and it is actually a worldwide program that we participate in. So you could go to the UK, you could go to Japan, Canada, what have you, um, and family group is there in some essence. But the stages that we follow is a welcoming kind of an introduction statement, ground rules, confidentiality, things like that. Then we get into the information sharing stage where we talk about what's going well in regards to be it safety or mental health, something like that. Um, and then we also talk about what's going, what are we worried about? What are those worries? We name it, we say it, we label it. And then we move on from there. It's not meant to be shaming and blaming. It's about naming it and then we move on. That's where we wanna move forward from. Um, we also sometimes do triggers, warning signs of either mental health symptomology that impacted the children or chemical use that impacted the children, neglect, physical abuse, what have you. Typically at that point in time, we take a break. When we come back, we go into stage three, which is what we call the family deliberation or family private time, where we offer the families an opportunity for them to deliberate without the social workers. The idea is that the social workers aren't creating the plan that the family is. Now, bottom lines are created by the social workers, so those minimum expectations that families need to follow. But for the most part, it is the families who are creating the plan. I would say probably about 60% of families just rather have the social workers stay and hear their deliberation, and then 40% kind of choose to have the social workers out. And I think a lot of it is for time. These are about three hour meetings. So this is a time commitment. Um, a really breaking of bread though as well. It's a gathering um, of people. You know, we offer, we have a grant that covers some offering food, things like that which has been unique in the COVID-19. You know, I am still doing, you know, on a typical week prior COVID-19, I would run sometimes three, four, five. I think my highest week was running five meetings in a week, which is very high. Right now with COVID-19, I'm still running about one to two a week, telephonic style. So very similar to how we're doing today or on a WebEx style. While it's not as great, you know, COVID-19 is kind of anti-family group, which is all about gathering, we've still been able to make it work um, and very successfully. I've been impressed with how well telephonic and WebEx format has been going. It takes a lot more prep work, um, but it has fruits in the end that it has been fortuitous. So 
And then lastly is the, uh, the presentation of the plan. So then the family will kind of review their plan and the social worker might ask some follow-up questions um, and then um, either accept it or the social worker will say, I need to consult with my team for a final approval. Um, but that's kind of, it, it's a very streamlined approach that is still highly facilitated, but with a lot of family input. I conclude with two quotes, um, one from a client perspective, and I'll just kind of read it. At the end of every family group, we collect summaries um, where people can do some reflection. And an uncle um, who attended a meeting had shared that this was a positive way to have family commit to helping people in their family who struggle with addiction, to hold them accountable and not enable their using, which hurts kids in the long term. So I thought that was neat that an uncle had shared that in regards to his attendance at a family group. I can also share kind of a perspective from a social worker who recently participated um, in a family group with a very difficult situation. It was a very intense meeting, um, but the results of it, I think both surprised both of us. So I'll just kind of quickly read what she had to share. I worked with a family who did not want to hold a family group meeting because they were very suspicious about any government entity, did not want to feel that um, only negative would be portrayed about their family and did not, not want anyone kind of telling them what to do and where to go. It made it nearly impossible to connect with the parents with much needed services and supports and moving forward with reunification. This was a family who was kind of stuck in relative foster care because the parents were um, not willing and not open to services and supports to help them move forward. In moving into the meeting, she reflects that she was surprised when the parents both agreed to participate in the family group conference. She said, I was very nervous um, as we got to the meat of the concerns. Um, and like I said, it was a very volatile family. Um, so her nervousness, I definitely recall. Um, they would, she worried that they would not be able to productively productively participate in discussion, or even might, you know, kind of storm out of the meeting. However, the parents were pleased that they got to decide who participated in the meeting. Um, they all knew well ahead of the meeting what the agenda was and what the purpose was. And at the end, they were all in agreement to the ground rules and making sure that everyone had a chance to be heard and respected. The meeting was very intense, which she says was expected, but it was also incredibly productive. The network was able to create a detailed safety plan so the children would be able to see their parents and extended family members over the winter holidays. Um, and there was a plan in place where everyone was able to be seen, but also safe as well as they move forward. So it was a neat experience. With that, I will turn it back over to Jody. Any questions? I just wanted to reflect on a couple of the Mr. outcomes. Chair? Yes. Um, Lisa Foby here. I just wanted to know how many families you said about five a week. So how many families throughout a year do you think you participate in this process with? Um, on an average year. So I came, thank you for the question. Um, on an, since I came um, into family group at Sherman County at the end of 2015, Every year since then, we have been doing about 60 to 70 meetings per year. Some years have been a little bit higher, um, but at least 60. I alone do about 65 myself a year. Um, on average, I would probably say, you know, the, the five week one was, that was an intense week. On average, it's about three. So I don't do math really well on the spot, um, but uh, you know, at least there's usually 10 people per meeting or more, sometimes less. So, you know, if we could look at, you know, between that 60 to 70 families that we serve. Um, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I have a question, Barb. <laughs> I was wondering how often do you meet with families? Is it one meeting or is it several meetings? Thank you. Um, it varies between families and situation. For the most part, family group is kind of a one and done meeting. Sometimes we do do a series of meetings up to three. What really occurs is family group is in there once or twice, but then the social workers from there 
continue with more informal meetings where they bring in different family members, maybe not the whole group, but in their ongoing case management, they then pick up the energy um, from the family group. So one is typical, two is likely, every once in a great while it's three meetings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A question, Mr. Chair, Daniel Alsi. Um, I was just curious in the time frame that you've been doing this, have you done a look back to see what kind of an impact this program had when they got older? Hmm. I'm going to defer to Jody on that one. She does more of our statistics and data gathering. Jody's up next, so we'll bring I'll her. try to answer her to that. The podium here. <laughs> um, I haven't seen any long-term studies, um, Commissioner, but I do know that it's a strong evidence-based practice with very positive outcomes in regards to repeat maltreatment. And our repeat maltreatment numbers are below the state standards, so that's a very positive thing. And we definitely attribute our family group practice to some of that um, repeat maltreatment. All right, thank you. I think the other things that we've really seen specific to Sherburne County is the rate of relative placements, and I do attribute that a lot to family group. So the state standard for that is 35.7%, and in Sherburne County we've always, well, we've been over 50% right now, about 56% of our kids in foster care are with relatives, so it's, it's a wonderful way to quickly identify relatives and have those children placed with relatives versus um, non-relatives. And then the last two slides really just kind of show our uh, reduction in out-of-home placement costs as well as out-of-home placement numbers. Um, I wouldn't say that the numbers are decreasing drastically, but any decrease at this state is really a positive thing. I've had other counties reach out to us when some of the state reports come out and they say, what are you doing in Sherburne County? Like our numbers <laughs> are increasing, so what are you doing? And I have to give a lot of credit to the family group process and to the staff who have the buy-in and for Andrea's great facilitation of just seeing really wonderful changes and outcomes with these families. Thank so. you, is there any, any other questions? Okay, I'll close this out then. Uh, I just uh, just want to thank you folks and it's it's like always, uh, we, we do the right thing and it has financial rewards for us. I mean, we spend a little bit of money here, but we improve the quality of our citizens' lives, improve quality of life for families and it, uh, it, it comes back and, and rewards them in ways and rewards us as a county financially. So I appreciate your efforts and all that you do in that regard, so thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Okay. Chair, I think we have Karen at least on audio now. Uh, we'll check here, and then she can do her presentation. Am I right, Karen? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can we hear got you. you, Karen. Great, so, thank you. Sorry, um, one more testament to why broadband's important in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> And Karen, if you just want to cue Keisha when you want to change slides, I don't know, you might be shooting blind otherwise, but hopefully you can see us even though we can't see you. I can see and hear you all. So I'm um, sorry about the connection issues. I've tried a couple of things here, but um, apparently I'm just too far away from Sherburne County today. Um, so thanks for the time on your agenda today. I, when we first scheduled this, uh, I thought, oh, this is a great week. It's National Library Week. What a better time to present about the library. And uh, since then, a lot's changed. And so I'll talk about what I was going to present about, but also give you an update on what the library is doing now. Um, so as you maybe know, Great River has been around for 50 years as of last fall. Sherburne County was uh, later to join the region in 1971, Sherburne County joined the other four counties at the time, and Elk River was the first library to join the region in 1972 from Sherburne County. So it was a pretty exciting time. Um, a lot's changed since then. And Keisha, if you want to advance to slide one, um, you can see what our borrower numbers look like. We have about 107,000 borrowers across the region and about 17% of those come from Sherburne County. 
And you can see we've got libraries in Becker, Big Lake, Elk River, and St. Cloud. About 8% of St. Cloud's borrowers come from the Sherburne County area. And Elk River is our most used location. It's the second largest library in the region. So we're very fortunate to have Sherburne County as one of our partners to deliver library service. On the next slide, you can see that um, last year, our digital checkouts did increase slightly. We moved to about 7% of our total circulation being digital. And when I was giving this presentation at the beginning of March, we were saying, you know, digital's just not moving quite as fast as we thought it would. But um, since then, um, we saw our biggest month ever in the digital library. And partly because we were closed for the last two weeks of March, we hit 20,000 circulations in March, which is a record-breaking month for us. And we had a 17% increase in active users of the digital library in March. So we expect April will be even bigger. One of our biggest challenges with that digital library during this time is the demand for services is so high. Um, over 48% of our audiobooks are checked out online right now and about 30% of the total collection. So it's, um, it's a good resource, but it's something we're having a harder time keeping up with because the demand has increased so high. We've also moved to doing curbside delivery um, this week. I think Elk River went live last week, Becker went live two weeks ago, and Big Lake is going live this week. So even though the libraries are closed, we are calling patrons who have physical items in on hold and they are scheduling a time to pick them up. It's completely contactless, but people are still able to check out their books. That being said, it is moving a lot slower than we normally do, so we're excited to get that service up and running, but I don't know um, if we'll be able to keep up with people's expectations right now. I know people are looking for ways to spend their time, and um, the Department of Education has asked us to develop those services to support distance learning across the state. If you go to the next slide, you can see our library programming was a huge uh, success last summer. Um, summer reading program reached a lot of kids across your county, and we had over 12,000 kids participate across the region. That being said, this year we anticipate it'll be more of an online program. We have an app called Beanstack, where we actually have some uh, reading challenges going on right now. And we anticipate using Beanstack to do the majority of the summer reading program this year. The other change we're making for the summer is simplifying the program so it's easier for people to participate. In the past, we used to say, you know, by June 8th, you can sign up, and when you're done, it's August 8th. We're going to just say summer reading programs June and July and really keep it as open-ended and easy as possible for people to participate. Uh, the next slide shows some of our other programs. You can see we had over 4,300 programs last year with 102,000 people attending. We don't require library card registration for programs, so even though um, you know that, that's a big number, it might not be reflected in the actual library card holders for your county. One of the programs we're launching this week as part of a statewide effort is One Book, One Minnesota. That program is highlighting uh, a book uh, that we want everyone to read and be part of the statewide book club. Through April and May, we're asking people to um, come and read our featured book. It is Kate DiCamillo's Because of Winn-Dixie. It's actually, it's the 20th anniversary of Because of Winn-Dixie, so it's a very good timing. And if you don't have a physical copy, there are simultaneous use digital books available for free on eBooks Minnesota. That's eBooksMN.org. And you can read that and share your thoughts with somebody so that you, you all have something in common. If you're wondering what you can do to connect with your grandmother over the phone, maybe you can read the book together on the phone. Um, we have lots of activities that will be coming out on our social media sites. It's also available on our Tumblebooks database, so if for some reason you don't want to use the eBooks Minnesota platform, you can use Tumblebooks with your library card. So we're really excited and hope lots of people will participate. Um, this week is National Library Week, and the theme is Find the Library at Your Place. 
So we're hoping that um, One Book, One Minnesota Book one, will be one of the ways you can find the library at your place. Another program that's coming up for National Library Week that will be highlighted on our social media accounts is a presentation from Doug Oman. He's done a lot of legacy programs for us across the years, and he has done books like um, Libraries of Minnesota, Barnes of Minnesota, and he has recorded a presentation for us to share on our Facebook page later this week. So even though we're not avail able to do programs in person, we are using our social media platforms to offer lots of different opportunities for people to participate. We have a virtual story time going. Um, one of our librarians, Ariel, is reading Alice in Wonderland, a couple of chapters each day this week. So if you're looking for a way to spend your time and, and um, engage it with reading and books, we have a lot of opportunities for you to do that from home. And then the next page is uh, our success story from last year. We went to no fines on juvenile materials starting in June, and that really did increase people's engagement with our juvenile books. Getting books in the hands of kids is one of our main, main goals. And um, one of the ways we're doing that during COVID-19 is we have now um, opened our library card application process online to any age and we're able to process those library cards even though you can't come into the library. So if you don't have a library card, we are um, processing those from home and behind the scenes through our secure connections, and we're able to connect people with our digital materials within 24 hours of them submitting that application. So we're very excited about that. So we wanna thank you for your partnership and um, being a strong county within Great River Regional Library. We do have some um, initiatives happening at the Capitol this session that are related to uh, libraries. One is an expansion of regional library telecommunications aid uses. It's something we've been asking for for a while, but it has been advanced as part of the COVID-19 legislation. So we're hopeful that if there are funds that are unused from that state pool that are typically used for our network connections and our equipment, that um, those funds are things that we can use for things like our GRL to go locker system, circulating Wi-Fi hotspots, or even adding to the digital library collection. And it seems like that uh, buildup's got some momentum, so we're hopeful that we will be able to do those things fairly soon. And then once the bonding legislation does move forward, the library improvement grant uh, is part of that bonding bill, and we're hopeful that that will move forward as well. So again, uh, thank you. I think our last slide says thank you. Uh, we appreciate your support, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. We have any questions? I'm wondering, how's your, uh, Karen, can you tell me about the chairman of the board there for uh, Great River Regional Library? Is uh, she working out or how's that going? She's, a, you know, she did a year as vice chair and chair of the finance committee and that seasoned her well for our chair of the Great River Board. She led us in our first ever Zoom meeting and doing roll call votes with about 15 people is, is a challenge, but we made it through in an hour. So <laughs> it was a fabulous meeting. She's been a great support through all of this, and I really appreciate Commissioner Phoebe's um, presence on our board. We also have two citizen members from the Sherburn County area, Mary Epperly and Jane Deets, and they're both serving on our fund development committee as well. Um, we really appreciate their um, contributions too. So thank you for sending us good people to help lead our organization. Well, we have high expectations of, uh, of those folks. And once again, they did not disappoint us. So thank you. Uh, Lisa, are you out there, Commissioner Foby? Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I may, I just, um, a few other things. Yes, Jane um, Deese, and Mary Eberly are amazing citizen support people on our library board. So that's really kudos to our board for appointing them. And then also I, I believe a number of our Sherburne County citizens also 
wander over and use the Monticello or Clearwater branches. So when Jane and Mary and I talk about our branches, we kind of include those in, in our branches because they're right on the border, as you all know. And just lastly, um, I do uh, participate weekly. I have since the COVID situation started with the staff director meetings with Karen. And um, it's just been amazing to watch the work that they've done and how they were able to work together on this. You know, they have, I hate to mention the fire, but closing down um, St. Cloud, actually, not that you want want to have that experience, but it provided them um, experience in having to close branches. So they are very good at it and very creative and always thinking about something new and and really working together well the best they can through this situation and and Karen's leadership is just exemplary so I just want to honor her in leading our library very good is there anything else uh, okay thank you uh, for your presentation today Karen keep up the good work Thank you, and thanks for being patient with the technical issues. I appreciate it. No problem. Okay, we'll move on to our uh, item three, and I see uh, Gina is in the room. Thank you, Keisha. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, well, for me, last fall seems like a lifetime behind us, <laughs> considering the situation that we've been navigating. But if you could think back to the fall roads tour, where you learned about the ambitious habitat enhancement project at Oak Savannah Park, um, the scale of that project and the fact that Oak Savannah Park is neighbors to private residential property owners made it critical that we really clarify the project boundary clearly on the ground for the contractor. And as we prepared to do that, we realized that there was no survey on file for Oak Savannah Park. Um, so our survey crew prioritized the completion of the north and east property boundaries before the project started. In that process, uh, they confirmed two encroachments on the east line from private property and they also found that the old fence, which is remaining from when the Cox family owned Oak Savannah Park and before Autumn Ridge development was platted, is not on the property line. It's actually five to 10 feet west or park side of the property line. So We've been in communication over the winter and this spring with the property owners about removing the encroachments. And um, to facilitate the entire removal, we decided it would be very helpful if we clearly marked the property boundary. So the survey crew, again, assisted me out in the field and uh, we marked the property boundary on the line. And our surveyor also found the property corner markers from the Autumn Ridge plat development, and those property corners matched the line that they determined last fall, which was a good thing. What when does that happen? <laughs> 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 well, I was relieved. Um, oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> but what isn't so great is that while I was out there, it was clear to us that the other six property owners that share our boundary are maintaining park property as their yard um, and have encroachments all the way up to the fence line. And those encroachments range from things like gardens and tools and lawn decorations, firewood, things like that. But um, Oak Savannah Park is in a perpetual conservation easement with the Minnesota Land Trust and those encroachments put the county in violation of that easement. So we need to work with the property owners to remove those encroachments. And our county attorney prepared agreement language, which is in your agenda packet. And it stipulates that the county and the landowner agree that 
the landowner is responsible for removing the encroachments at their own expense uh, by September 1st of 2020. It provides for the possibility of extension um, under acts of God or extenuating circumstances at the discretion of our public works director. And it provides um, for the possibility of failure to act um, and stipulates that um, if the property owner doesn't remove the encroachments, the county will do it at the property owner's expense. And then the agreement will be terminated upon entire removal of the encroachments. And that summarizes the situation that we're in. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, and actually by, with the, uh, our relationship with the Minnesota Land Trust, we, we can't allow that, right? Correct. I mean, we, you know, there's been, there's different situations where we may license that uh, with highways and that sort of thing. That's not an option for us here. So this, our hand is not being enforced by uh, what we're doing. It's being enforced by the people that, the, the land trust that helped us buy this park. Or, Correct. So. Are there any other questions on this? Mr. Shanks, and Gina, you said you've, you've spoken to some of the landowners. Are you, what are you getting as far as comments or sentiment back? Both ends of the spectrum. Very pleasant and apologetic to very unpleasant and awkward. So, okay. yeah. And I, and I asked, I mean, obviously it's my district and I haven't heard anything from any of those constituents yet. So I, that's why I was curious as, as to how that was going. But They um, received letters about 12 days ago and I haven't heard from the remaining six yet. So we'll be probably reaching out again. Well, it's pretty easy if you're cutting the grass to take an extra swipe, and over time we kind of expand. So I think you know you can understand how it happened, and uh, and we just need to remedy at this point, and that's what this does. Yep, absolutely. And like you said, there it's a it's a range of encroachments. I think I saw some. There was maybe a sprinkler head that even ended up over there. So. Correct. It's going to be a different monetary impact for every one of those property owners, so I'm sure that'll be correlated with their attitudes towards it. So True, yes. Well, and some of them it is paver blocks and that sort of thing, so... Yep, uh, fence... It'll have to get wider and narrower. Or <laughs> right. So, okay. Can we have a motion to uh, move forward with this? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval. To approve the terms of the agreement for removal of private property from park property for eight parcels. Motion by Dolan. Mr. Chair, oh, okay. that motion. Seconded by Danielski. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, we'll do a roll call. Danielski. Aye. Commissioner Barant. Aye. Foby. Aye. Dolan. Aye. Schmeezing votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is the uh, consideration of a resolution to abate the penalty on late payment of property taxes. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. As you know, we had discussed um, this possibility at a previous um, county board meeting. And since then, we've had a lot of interaction with our neighboring counties. And they're in various stages of um, implementing either this same, one, this same type of a resolution or something very similar to it. Um, the discussion has been, uh, I believe Dan had sent out a email to all our cities and townships and our school districts, and the consensus was that, that most were all in favor, were favorable of that versus um, a moving a due, a due date, which we don't have the authority to do. This we have the authority to do to abate penalties as statute has provided to us and to the county board. 
So before you is a request for a resolution to consider abating the penalty on late payment for property taxes for the year of 2020 until Ju uh, July 30th um, of 2020. And what we wanted to do is, is um, what is being proposed to you and which is stated in the resolution um, that we would be charging a 1% penalty from May 16th through June 30th, and then a 2% penalty through July 31st. And after that date for June or for August and going forward, then we would be going right back to the regular scheduled um, penalty um, that is stated in the um, in by statute, unless there's a change that comes from the state of Minnesota. So we've got that caveat also in the RBA that was drafted by um, Tim Syme, so thank you very much, Tim, for all the information. You've provided a lot more than what we were talking about, but this, it really outlays it very well and thoroughly, so we do appreciate that. And our administrator, um, Bruce Meslett, had also shared this um, same information with the, I, th I believe, with all, with AMC, and so it went out to multiple of counties. Our um, taxing, um, system, our M system, um, programming system that we have, they are working on trying to rewrite um, the penalty part of it because it's uh, coded in, so we're trying to get that in there as well. They're working on that right now. I haven't gotten an update re uh, recently on that, but I know they are working on it. So hopefully we won't have to be doing all these calculations by hand, but if we do, we do, and, and we'll move forward. But um, Therefore, um, before you is the resolution that we'd like to present to you and for consideration of approval uh, for 2020. Are there any questions? Any questions from other board members? No questions. So this will take us through? Through July 31st. Through July 31st. We'll, uh, and as appropriate, we may discuss this again as we get close to that deadline. We're going to see what impacts correct and where we're at at that point. So this doesn't necessarily mean that this is all that we are going to do, but this is all that we are going to do at this point, which is, I think, pretty significant uh, help for folks if they if they need to put something off. <coughs> they certainly can do that. So. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd, I'd echo that. I think the important thing for the public to understand is that we're taking incremental actions to give people the breathing room that we think they need. We don't, we don't know what the governor is going to do. We don't know what the markets are going to do. We don't know how long of a period of time um, any of this stuff will go on. Um, all we can do is work with the information in front of us, and I think that this is a, a great step in doing that and providing a, a little extra time for the people that really need it. Dan, uh, do you have anything else you wanted to add? You can think of. Just okay. Are there any other questions? If there are no other questions, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chair. Yes. I'll make that motion to approve. Moved by uh, Commissioner Danielski. Is that right? I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion on this? So, Mr. Chair, I just um, would like to add, I did hear from a couple residents on this and a number of business owners. So I, I think this is going to be very appreci appreciated by our community. Okay. Hey, Mr. Um, Chair? Yes. I, I um, echo the same comments that um, Lisa made. We've heard from our um, business owners and anything, they're appreciative of anything we can do to help. Um, but I was curious, have we heard anything more? Is the state planning on doing anything? Have they been talking about anything? I don't believe so. We'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Messelt for. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Um, as of uh, yesterday, uh, there is still some discussion at the state with two possible actions 
Uh, one would be to uh, delay s payment of the state portion of property taxes, which uh, we've weighed in could be somewhat problematic just because of the mechanics of separating out state property tax from others. Um, and then the other discussion was uh, about delaying um, the April 15th uh, payment or May 15th mm -hmm. payment. Um, and that could cause issues with cash flow with schools and townships and counties um, in, that maybe don't have sufficient reserves to make it through that delay. Uh, I would note that we've also now been asked recently by the governor's administration to uh, provide levels of uh, reserves, which we probably are guessing a bit, but we believe that's either part of the governor's evaluation of this or it's part of a budgetary look at reductions in aid going forward in the future. So it's still an active conversation in St. Paul, but nothing concrete at this point. Um, thank you, Bruce. Um, I would hopefully we can continue to work and try to push that um, for giving that state general tax on the business community for um, this property tax payment time, I think would be hugely helpful. So if we can figure out any way to make that a reality, I think that would be a very, um, very um, helpful to the business community. But we're doing what we can with what we're going to be doing right now. And uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the commission, Commissioner Danielski, uh, with respect to your, your specific comment, uh, I know AMC has weighed in and suggested to the state a mechanical process that would allow counties to still process it but not collect it so that we wouldn't have to do the manual change on every tax bill. So there is some discussion about that state property tax delay or waiver, and that is still active even though we've said, hey, this could be problematic for 87 auditor treasurers. Um, on that note, I, I just want to note for the board and the community uh, the leadership that Diane and Dan have shown on this. Um, Diane has brought this to the state auditor treasurers group um, and advocated for it. She's held conversations with our regional partners. Um, Dan has been instrumental in AMC's work on this. It, it's a very creative and a can-do attitude, and uh, I really, really appreciate the leadership, and I know you do as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I would also like to add that I have been contacted personally by um, numerous businesses and um, property owners, you know, in relation to COVID-19 and people losing, you know, or being laid off or fur furloughed and so forth. And they said, well, anything that you can do would be helpful. We would really appreciate it. So it's been positive comments from them. Well, really what we want to accomplish here is we want to want to help our citizens and our businesses with cash flow. And uh, this COVID-19 has created a cash flow crunch for a number of them, a number of them having been closed. So if you get to May 15th, don't pay your taxes. The penalty will not be that bad. And you'll have a chance to get caught up later on. So that's basically what we're trying to do is to help. We're trying to manage our cash flow, mm -hmm. and we're trying to help folks with theirs and our businesses with theirs, which may be really huge. Uh, with that, I will call the roll. Commissioner Danielski. Aye. Commissioner Barrett. Aye. Commissioner Foby. Aye. Commissioner Dolan. Aye. Commissioner Schmeezing votes aye. Carries unanimously. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our budget planning. Good schedule. morning, commissioners. Good morning. Believe it or not, it's time to start talking 2021 budget already. And within your packet, you do have a budget schedule. There's a couple key dates I wanna highlight on there for you to make sure they're on your calendar. We are scheduling the budget workshops with departments on August 4th and 5th, and I believe an invite was sent out to you about a month ago. If not, let me know and we'll make sure to take care of that, but we definitely want that meeting on your schedule. The preliminary budget and levy would be approved on September 22nd with the TNT hearing on December 3rd, and then December 15th would be the final approval of the budget and levy. 
And typically during this meeting, I would go through an analysis of the last 12 months of data, and I did start to put that together in March, and things were looking pretty good. But obviously the economy and the world has changed a lot since early March, so I'm not gonna go through any data today because I'm not sure how meaningful it is considering where we're at as, as a country and an economy. So we hope by August that we'll have some meaningful data. We'll compare this year's April through August timeframe for the last several years, and hopefully we can determine some trends from that data and kind of prepare for the 2021 budget. So with that, I don't have anything to have approved today. I just wanted to make sure you had a copy of the calendar and had those dates in your, in your outlooks and, and make sure where everybody's on the same page. So with that, I'll open up for any questions if anyone has any. Are there any questions from the board? It, we're, we're gonna get pushed back and it's gonna be a bit of an expedited uh, budget uh, process this year and it's probably gonna be a little a little bit different than what we're used to in right. terms we of- We understand it's gonna be a challenging year, 2021, so staff is being prepared for that. Are there any other questions? I don't believe this schedule is just a schedule. It's just we information only, to, correct. We don't need to approve it, so. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dan. It is gonna be a difficult budget year for us, no doubt. We're going to, uh, it's going to be a struggle to hold things together, so. Appreciate everybody's input on that. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda which is COVID-19 pandemic outbreak and county response. It uh, says Mr. Messelt underneath here. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. I believe Amanda's gonna join us as well uh, to just give you the latest update from public health and I'll let her start and then I will follow up with the organizational response. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning. Commissioners, thank you, Keisha, that's perfect. Yes, ma'am. Um, just a quick situation summary for um, your COVID update. Uh, so as of yesterday's report, uh, statewide there are 2,470 cases, 237 of those have been hospitalized, 126 were in the ICU, and 143 deaths have been reported. Up here, uh, Keisha pulled up our um, surveillance report for Sherburne County specifically. Um, for Sherburn County, there are 13 cases, nine of, or sorry, six of which are active, um, meaning they're in some stage of uh, MDH monitoring. So um, we've had some people who are hospitalized, some people under isolation orders, so they're kind of in, in some stage of that. Um, there are seven of our Excuse cases that- Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes, Commissioner Foby. Just uh, wondering if there's something on the screen we're not seeing that now, or maybe it's just me. We have the COVID-19 surveillance okay. report, Sherburne County. You don't have that on your screen? No, nothing on, and I see attorney Haney shaking her head no, so not just okay. me. No, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna try to share our screen here. Keisha's trying to do that right now. Okay, thank you. Try maybe stop it and restart. Try stop and restart it on the share stream. Oh, hi guys. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Anything now? Any luck? There we go. Yes. All right. Thanks yep. for catching that, thank Lisa. You. Thank you. Um, seven of our cases are off isolation. Three of them have been hospitalized. Two of them have been in the ICU. Sherburne County has zero deaths, and there's been two reports um, in congregate care facilities, and those are either people who are working, who are contracted, or who are living in congregate care, care settings. Um, note that uh, MDH does have that congregate care information on their website, but they will not report it if the facility itself is under 10 people for patient, patient privacy. Um, these numbers sometimes change um, when there is a new update uh, to the MDH line list. I get those about 6.30 um, the evening prior uh, to it being posted. And uh, particularly in the last week and a half to two weeks, uh, there's been a lot of errors or people that are posted and then 
retracted. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with um, geographic limitations. There's a lot of those shared zip codes where they're on and then they're off. Um, and then uh, MDH is constantly making updates to that line list just in terms of how they refine what they're posting out to the general public. And we've noticed um, some of that. So uh, really when we receive those line lists, we kind of take it as a glance. And so if you're comparing um, report to report, I understand that. I want to do that too, um, but unfortunately um, our information is as good as what MDH gives us. Um, another interesting thing that I heard about, there's been a lot of talk at Unified Command about the different models and really when is our peak, what is our search capacity, when is all this coming, um, and um, the answer is I don't know. Uh, models are just that. They're models and they're uh, predicated on what the information um, they take in is. Uh, but the, the governor is using University of Minnesota modeling and um, we last uh, heard a day or two ago that um, they are saying kind of in terms of that modeling limitation, really 1% of all cases are lab confirmed. Um, and so really a better estimate is to take whatever your number is, statewide or county base number and to multiply that by 100. So um, take that for what it is. Um, in terms of our response, um, Public Health is launching a COVID hotline hopefully tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Um, we've um, currently are taking uh, COVID related questions uh, on our public health intake number and um, that's just kind of gone haywire. Um, also Wright, Stearns, Benton all have um, county specific um, county specific hotlines and really we've just uh, thought that the time is now to, to launch a Sherburne County specific hotline. Um, so we don't want to duplicate the efforts of MDH and so really our Sherburne County specific hotline will be talking about donations. Um, most of the time those are all funneled through the EOC um, but daycares, schools, especially as we start talking about cloth mask and cloth mask or cloth covering um, drives. Um, we're getting a lot of those questions. A lot of businesses are asking for help and they just don't know where to turn to for those um, paycheck protection programs or SBA loans or different grants that are out there. Um, as well as um, just health questions. Obviously we can reiterate the MDH guidance um, but in terms of that critical decision making we would then pass those calls off to the uh, to the state MDH hotline. So I just wanted to let you know that that will be up, up and running if you see that on Facebook or other social media channels. Um, Friday at 2 p.m. the governor uh, at the governor's press conference he made a statement that all 775 fire departments are going to start collecting those cloth coverings for long-term care facilities congregate care uh, settings and that's going to be this Saturday April 25th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. As of yesterday's Un Unified Command briefing um, the fire departments uh, in our local uh, jurisdictions um, have yet to get that information from the state um, and so we'll see at tomorrow's update if they've gotten any more direction but public health is has offered and and will plan on assisting um, as the fire departments um, want uh, assessing needs at long-term care facilities and other congregate care settings, as well as help with distribution of that if they so choose. Um, but the fire departments are the, the collection site. And testing, there's also been a lot of uh, conversation and reports on testing and what that looks like. Um, there's two different tests. One is a serology test and then one is a diagnostic test. Both are in short supply but one more so than the other. The diagnostic test is really, I'm sick, I'm symptomatic, do I have COVID or just a case of the flu or other bug. Uh, the serology test is really that um, pinprick test that the governor has talked about um, where it's uh, blood work and they detect the presence of um, antibodies in the blood um, and that's uh, tested after the person has been infected or had COVID uh, and that really helps um, population wise in terms of helping determine immunity uh, particularly as the governor is talking about opening up, when do we do that, how many people have been infected, that's gonna be another critical tool in, in helping assess that. Um, the CDC has uh, received approval for a test and they're gonna start um, 
launching that the, or start testing the week of March 30th in Washington in New York City. But um, we're very lucky because uh, Minnesota is kind of a, a, a medical hub. And so the University of Minnesota and the Mayo Clinic have also developed um, a serology test that's had great effectiveness. So no uh, rollout dates to be determined, um, but um, both have claimed that they have the capacity to test about 10,000 per day. And they're gonna start in the metro and then the east central region. I say all that information because there's been a lot of talk on our MDH phone calls on what is that going to look like for local public health. We know the tsunami's coming. We know that um, local public health is going to be asked to pick up a lot. We just don't know what it is or what that looks like. And when I talk about um, public health, uh, you know, our department or our division within the Health and Human Services Department is only about 20 people. And so where do we call on Greater HHS and then also Greater Sherburne County and then our other partners? Um, and so I, I, I say that kind of as a forewarning where we think something's coming, something big that's really going to um, stretch our capacity, but we don't know what that looks like yet. Keisha, I don't know if you could pull up the second and I don't even know, quite frankly, how beneficial it is, but just, um, yeah, you can't even see it. Um, this is our ICS chart that we're working of. So again, you don't need to read the names, just a, a quick visual that the ICS chart is getting bigger as our response gets bigger. Um, and so uh, under operations, really that's kind of public, where public health is, is um, directing the operations of this COVID response. We've added a PPE, personal protection equipment, and a donation management, um, and also community education around that. Um, you've heard Jody talk about sheltering and that's still a moving target, still discussions. There's another 1030 phone call around sheltering. We've added a hotline and a surveillance box. Um, we've added a testing box. Haven't put anything under there yet, but we know something around that is coming. And so uh, we'll be build, building out that branch um, when we know more. And then also we've already um, kind of built out our mass dispensing because we know when a vaccine uh, is available, um, then we'll be called on to, to help with that, as well as um, however this testing looks, um, we'll be able to probably replicate that structure pretty easily in terms of testing. In terms of EOC uh, updates, uh, the EOC remains activated, and um, there is a lot of uh, discussion with sharing of information. I know I've spoken to this board prior about the sharing of uh, the information. Now MDH um, does put names and addresses and other identifying information on that line list. Um, there was... Um, that is HIPAA protected information, uh, but um, in other states that's being released to first uh, responders and law enforcement. So that went to the Attorney General's office and the Attorney General um, did decide that um, that information could be shared with uh, first responders and law enforcement, but the controls around that is really um, strict in terms of what information that they're getting, when they get that information, and when that information needs to be purged from their system. So just know um, that I think that has already already started that um, first responders in our community are getting um, notification when there is a lab confirmed person in isolation, but then I think that has to be purged once that person is off isolation, and that is not for local public health to divulge. Um, that would be a, a infraction of um, the governor, uh, data practices. Those are all my updates. Does anybody have any questions? Are there any questions for Amanda? Amanda, when Mr. you were Chair, I have a question. Go ahead, Rayanne Danielski. Amanda, um, when you were talking about the um, state saying that the fire departments in our state are going to be collecting masks on Saturday for um, distribution to nursing homes, is there a template that they're looking for so there's a certain way they want the mask made? I know there's a lot of people, like if this went on Facebook, there's a lot of sewers and people that are working on these that I know would really want to participate. Yes, Commissioner, thank you. Um, the There is um, uh, kind of instructions, if you will, that MDH has pulled out. So you could do a quick Google search and find those um, those templates, uh, as well as the governor does have on his website um, information about the cloth mask or cloth covering uh, drive, and I think information on that. There's a there's a permalink to back to the MDH website. Um, so um, that can be found, and if you'd like, I'd, I'd be happy to send those instructions out to the board. Yes, please. Um, and like I said, we can work on Facebook Absolutely. to put out this request. 
Amanda, when you talk Thank about you. something. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, Rand, did you have more? No, I said no. Thank you. When you talk about something big coming, um, are you are you, are you talking about a larger peak as we go out, or are you talking about maybe uh, public uh, Minnesota Department of Public Health pushing uh, work down onto you that they are currently doing, and as time goes on, they're not going to want to continue to do it. Right. Commissioner, I think both. I think the governor himself said yesterday that we're starting to see the deaths and, and the numbers rise more rapidly, so we're climbing that peak. Um, but what I was referring to is um, as more testing becomes available, I think local public health and counties will be called on to help with that. And then there's also that contact tracing and contact investigation. So really trying to say, okay, now you, you've been tested. Who did you come in contact with? How are you exposed? Uh, as the numbers go up, that requirement is going to go up. Also with essential services and sheltering and all of the things that come with that, our mandated responsibility is on lab confirmed cases. And so if the diagnostic testing goes up, then what does that look like for our response? So um, we're lucky enough to be grouped into the Metro for a lot of our different public health responsibilities and grants and emergency management. Um, and so certain counties in the Metro are already piloting certain things and hearing different things. So at this point, it's just conjecture, but we think something is coming. And the modeling is just that, it's modeling. We have modeling out there that shows that we're 12 days past our peak. I hope that's right, mm -hmm. but we can't base our response on just that. We have to base it on what the governor is telling us and how he is leading us at this point, so. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Amanda? Thank you. So Mr. Chair, I'll just add a few organizational responses. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> included you. in your packet, I'm sorry. I was just thanking him. Oh, yeah, thanks, man. Um, including in your packet uh, was a, an update on the county's financial response and organizational response. Uh, and then we did uh, put out a public facing uh, summary of that memorandum. Uh, because it's dealing with personnel issues, we did keep it forward confidential. Um, just a summary for the board, and then I'll answer any questions you might have on those responses. Uh, first of all, we are, we are recognizing, as you heard Dan allude to, uh, that this is going to be a, a long-term impact on the county, uh, not just its operations in terms of the pandemic response, but looking into 2021 20, uh, from a budget standpoint and an operational standpoint. As a result, we've started to take some significant financial and organizational steps to prepare the county, and they include the following. Uh, first of all, we've implemented a uh, hiring freeze <coughs> on all uh, new positions in the 2020 budget that were not already filled. Uh, that's the effect of freezing 12 new positions. Um, just for board information, if we did an extrapolation for an annual salary savings, that would uh, uh, be somewhere just south of a million dollars a year. Um, I would note that not all of that is levy revenue for salaries, but those levies are already down uh, excuse me, those revenues are also already down. For instance, uh, correctional officers, uh, we're not seeing the uh, the money coming in from the ICE contract. So as a result, it is, it is an effective savings. Uh, second of all is to do a soft hiring freeze on replacing existing positions, uh, case by case review of, uh, of whether or not we will be filling those positions and when. Um, Third is uh, work assignments and reassignments to keep people working. Um, that has affected uh, 15 uh, full or part-time employees so far, including some who have been on furlough uh, because of lack of work. On that note, I would like to specifically uh, recognize and thank Bruce Price for his amazing work uh, in the Veteran Services Office to uh, really put some folks to work that we otherwise would not have worked for on a very valuable project. And with the board's permission, maybe Bruce can just uh, highlight that project for you and talk about uh, what he's having our folks do. Certainly, if you would, please, Bruce. Good morning, Mr. Chair and um, the board. 
This is uh, just a, a quick summary. Uh, we have uh, roughly, um, since I arrived in 2012, we were around 3,000 uh, under Gene's uh, leadership. Right now, we've uh, just breached over 9,100 9, uh, active files. So we've added uh, about 6,000 to almost 7,000 files. Um, and what we're uh, uh, doing right now is going back and trying to locate, uh, actually contact um, those individuals um, within their own files and update their information to make sure that they're correct um, and still alive um, to include their spouses. So with 9,100 uh, separate files, which are by their social security number, uh, so there's no du duplicates there, uh, that also includes their spouses, so that's about a half. So we're looking at about 13,000 people that we want to verify are still um, residing here in, in the county. Um, and that's what uh, I've been assisted by uh, Jay's, a couple of folks from Jay's department and, and also Diane's uh, department. So, and I thank the uh, leadership here too for helping us uh, attain that. And I, did, I really want to thank Bruce, as, as Felix knows, because he was here that day. We were struggling with uh, what to do with some folks who we just simply had no work to do. And Bruce is like, hey, I've got a great project. It's ready to go. He conducted training within two business days and put people to work, uh, most of them remotely, I want to note. So uh, really been amazing. And that kind of leadership is, as you know, endemic of your organization, but it's also nice to highlight it. So thank you, Bruce. Um, the fourth response that we did was to uh, take a serious look at our capital improvement program and our public works projects for this year. Uh, we've uh, delayed replacement of vehicles and equipment. Uh, we've delayed projects that aren't uh, critical, such as concrete work. Uh, we're reducing costs where we can. Examples would be taking advantage of oil and asphalt price drops to get good project uh, costs. Uh, those savings already are in upwards of a half a million dollars of, of capital savings. Uh, although I would note delaying projects is not an absolute savings. We'll have to do them at some point. Uh, you may have also seen, um, we also have brought uh, contract projects back in house, such as uh, sweeping our parking lots, which normally we have a contractor do. We did that with in-house staff. And then finally, uh, reductions in operating expenses, <coughs> including taking a serious look at travel training, uh, and professional development that it's critical at this time. Uh, taking a look at both hardware, software, and licensing costs, office supplies, furniture, fixtures, and equipment reductions. And also of note for the board is we've identified 1.5 vacant FTEs to be permanently reduced. Uh, so there's a reduction in force of 1.5 FTEs there. Um, all of those together represent the current response. Um, I would be interested to know if the board is, uh, is uh, okay with that, if you see further or more dramatic adjustments. Otherwise, what I'll be doing is updating that for you periodically. But uh, absent calling an emergency board meeting uh, and under the authorities that you gave the unified command, I thought it was necessary to put these five steps in place. And so I'll stand for any questions the board may have or additional direction you may have. Are there any questions for <coughs> Mr. Messel? I don't really have a question, but I do, I do have a comment. I mean, I think it's important that we we do as much uh, cutting and, and control our expenses as possible. But I also think that some of with our construction projects and some of those things, they're going to be part of reopening this country for business. So as we're moving forward, I think we need to be recognized that as, as we reopen, we need to continue to, to honor the contracts we have with contractors and we need to we need to be part of the part of the greater community in terms of business as we get going here. We're not quite there yet, but when we get there we should be we should be rolling forward. Hopefully the rest of the economy will will join us doing that. So Mr. Chair, I'll just add, uh, I want to thank Bruce and the rest of the staff for the way you guys have all tackled this in a proactive manner. Um, you know, every every decision when it comes to this type of thing is is kind of made on the fly, and 
and taking certain things for for granted and projecting out over time and it's it's not an easy thing to do and generally speaking uh, the public as a whole doesn't necessarily understand the full financial ramifications of certain decisions that they sometimes demand when stuff like this happens um, and I think I appreciate what you've done thus far I, I think it's it's functioning well um, and we gave you that authority in our in our previous motions and I think that that uh, should stay that way and obviously we'll just have to keep an eye on things as we go forward and we're coming into the budget process and I think a lot of that will start to take care of itself as we go through that and uh, as long as everybody keeps their eye on the ball I think this organization will get through it just fine um, I have I have the utmost faith in our department heads <clears throat> in in making smart strategic decisions when it comes to to this type of this type of deal so well, I appreciate the the feedback um, I, I will tell you and I've shared this with you I think either an email or conversation um, you know you're in a, a response mode and I would even say a crisis response mode when decisions that would normally take weeks are being done in days and decisions that were done in days are now being done in hours and yeah you've seen that and felt some of that so my obligation to you is to keep you updated between board meetings and this type of memo will be the process um, and I would have a request and I appreciate the fact that you're willing then to help with the communication and the transparency because as we're busy tinkering with the operations sometimes uh, we're not as good about getting that word out so a special thanks to each of you for taking that role and, and communicating it and also telling us when we need to uh, stop and synthesize it so it can be communicated and I think it's worked well the last two weeks between board meetings and uh, we'll continue on that path uh, and uh, Mr. Chair, your your comments are duly noted on on being judicious and what we do stop for other contracts. Um, moving forward, then just a couple other notes for the board. Um, we are in the process of doing uh, planning for reopening, uh, in, in anticipation that, uh, as you've discussed, that there will be some sort of of staging of reopening of our society, and that means also our services. Uh, for your information and the public's, uh, we are looking at three different major scenarios. Uh, looking at a reopening on May 4th, which is consistent with the governor's current uh, shelter in place or stay at home order. Uh, looking at a May 18th reopening, uh, which is more consistent with what other states are doing and also runs basically in line with the executive uh, order for an emergency by the governor. That would be anticipating that there would be some sort of of extension again of the shelter in place order and then looking at potentially a June, June 1st trigger date which is consistent with some of the the more um, locked down states and it is potentially feasible that the governor may decide that we need to continue in some sort of a closed mode up through uh, May within those three dates and looking at how we would uh, we would act or react the first thing we're doing of course is looking to making sure our staffing assignments are productive. Uh, if they're not, and I'll be honest with you, the longer we're locked down, the more challenging it will be. Uh, and we've even talked to Andrew about possibly having uh, folks assigned to work crews to be out in the field uh, if that's a productive use of time versus going through a furlough process or, or something of, the, of that like. But if we're talking six more weeks, it's different than two more weeks. Um, also within that, there's an assumption about either full or partial reopening of our communities. Um, the full, of course, would be returning essentially to what we were before the shelter in place. The partial could be anything from uh, vulnerable uh, populations being still sheltered to a recommendation of those vulnerable persons being sheltered to some variation of the same. And you've seen that almost on a daily basis as the governor has released certain segments of the economy to go back to work. And then the base assumptions with all of these uh, as we move forward is that we anticipate for the next several weeks, if not months, these will be the base assumptions uh, that whatever we see for reopening, there will be social distancing and that our operations need to incorporate at least for the next several weeks, if not months, uh, social distancing restrictions um, uh, or a better word maybe might be physical distancing restrictions. Uh, limited large uh, number gatherings, uh, additional hygiene and cleaning, um, addressing facial coverings and face masks, both by our, our customers and our constituents as well as our employees, 
and then uh, also looking at uh, the functionality of appointments and how well that worked to limit gatherings and to limit social distancing issues and also construction of additional barriers between folks so that at our transaction counters people can conduct business in person but still have a, a, a plexiglass or a glass barrier. Um, so those are the, the things that we're looking at as we develop this week, kind of our operational plan. Uh, hopefully we'll know more this week and then of course early next week will be kind of the trigger point you know, on whether we get ready for May 4th or we're back in this shelter in place for a while. Uh, last but not least, I just want to note that some things do get lost in the, in the shuffle. Uh, we've noted them once in a while. I do want to note for the board, uh, one thing that will also get lost in the shuffle besides uh, library week is that tomorrow is supposed to be Administrative Professionals Day. And uh, it's going to be difficult to celebrate that. Uh, so we're going to celebrate it virtually and then make sure that when we're back together, we celebrate it appropriately. And I know that you'll pass on uh, the thanks that you have for our administrative professionals as well. Um, but these are the types of things that just get kind of lost as we move on. So on behalf of, uh, of your leadership staff, we would, we would want to recognize and thank all of our administrative professionals for the amazing work that they do uh, day in and day out. And now they're doing virtually day in and day out. So with that, that's the update on my summary, sir. Thanks. <coughs> thank you. Uh, We'll move on then to uh, Commissioner Correspondence. Uh, we'll go through that in the same order we did the, uh, the roll call. Sorry, Rayanne, you'll be first up. I, I, and I don't expect that we will have a lot of anything at all except for the, uh, the updates that we've been in. But we'll, we'll begin with you if we could, Rayanne. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and you are correct. There is not a whole lot other than the um, COVID briefings that we have been having Wednesday and Friday. Um, I was able to um, be online for the April 8th, the April 10th, the April 15th, and the April 17th updates. And again, want to thank staff for all of their hard work. These updates are very informational um, and a lot of good things happen when uh, we're having the conversation about what's happening at the county and in, in, in our world. And I did have an EDA meeting, um, attended that by um, Web, WebEx and that went well. We did a little cleaning up of some of the language in our, um, oh, help me with the words, guys. The, Bylaws. Um, Bylaws. Yes, thank you. Thank you yes, yeah, that. So there wasn't a whole lot. Um, it was a short meeting. So that's pretty much it for me. Thank you, Commissioner Brandt. Hi, I just um, went to the briefings on a weekly basis and no other meetings. Thank you. Commissioner Foby. Um, uh, the COVID-19 county briefings, as all have mentioned, uh, we did have a MICA meeting on the 8th. Um, we did have a Zoom soil and water meeting on the 9th. And Roger Hansen was even on it. No, Roger. Nelson. Roger from Blue Hill was on. Nelson. <laughs> Nelson. Yeah. So of note. <laughs> so Felix, you'll have to ask him about that. Um, the 14th, we did have, as Karen mentioned, the Great River Regional Library Board meeting. And then, as I said earlier, I've been on the directors' meetings once or twice a week. Um, we had two ISD 728 leadership meetings with Dr. Dan Bittman. And then a sad uh, thing I'd like to share is as uh, Administrator Messelt shared um, on one of our briefings that Mille Lacs County had their first um, positive COVID um, diagnosis, uh, that person al also has died. And that some of you may have known District Judge Steve Anderson. And I share that just any death from COVID-19 obviously is, is sad, but that the Princeton community is, is very, very sad with the passing of District Judge Steve Anderson to COVID-19. Okay. And that is it. Thank you, Commissioner Foley. Commissioner Dolan. 
Um, I did participate in the EDA meeting, even though I'm not on that. And one thing Ryan um, maybe missed there is we did take, a, or the EDA did take action to um, allow forbearance on the uh, revolving loan fund clients that we do have within the uh, within the community, um, which doesn't have a huge monetary impact to us, but it does to them. Um, so that was uh, a good thing to get past. Those go through uh, the end of October, and then we waive. They waived uh, the application fee for those funds as well um, going forward for the rest of the year. <clears throat> uh, Magic Fund meeting um, was very interesting yesterday. Um, even even with the uh, even with the the crash in the market last quarter when when COVID kind of took hold. Um, it's good to know that the Magic Fund stayed within its operating parameters, no emergency board notification or anything like that. So it was, it was nice to see that um, our county funds were well managed there. Um, we did get an update from U.S. Bank, which is the custodian of the Magic Fund, um, and they wanted us to make sure that we pass along. Um, they're seeing a massive uptick in uh, fraud right now due to everybody switching to online payments, contactless payments. Um, even within the government sector, um, everybody going to ACHs, uh, taking the due diligence to make sure that they put in uh, account numbers correctly, routing numbers correctly, and uh, monitor all their accounts. The, it's, it's a very alarming uptick in, in fraud right now, so um, pass that message on to uh, anyone you can. AMC Business and Partner Development Committee uh, last week uh, was basically just presentations from some uh, staff at NACO about their uh, methods they're using to at the national level that we can replicate at the at the state level, um, and then I had NACO Tech and Telecom Committee meeting as well. Okay, I um, three times a week I'm in here for command meetings. Uh, had a MICA meeting. Uh, MESB meetings, uh, so there's been a few meetings. I also attended the EDA meeting on the phone, so uh, there's been there's been activity on your chair's part. Uh, I just want to uh, close with a couple of comments. First of all, thanks to the command team that has been really helpful through this. Uh, hopefully when we have our our next board meeting on May 5th, we are talking about some different things and reopening and, and getting things going again would really be, be helpful. And hopefully we'll be looking at uh, some different modeling and uh, kind of see how we're going to be affected as we go forward here. Uh, with that said, uh, appreciate all of your folks' patience and help, help with this and we'll keep moving forward, keep our chins up. Uh, with that, I'll adjourn the regular board meeting. We're going to take a 10-minute break. If we could, we will be back here at a quarter to uh, 11 to have our ditch meeting. That's possible.
called the open the business for any reason? Turn my camera up here. Good morning. We're going to open the Ditch Authority meeting. Mike? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I thought I'd lighten the mood a little bit. Um, they say timing is everything in, in life, right? <laughs> it was getting down to the wire at our house. <laughs> down to about a handful, but sometimes you get lucky. Timing is everything. So <laughs> whoever thought toilet paper would be what? such a commodity. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, County Ditch 13, uh, clearing and, and grubbing operations are complete. Uh, majority of the work was all on the east end by the lake. Uh, lots of deadfall, um, lots of brush obstructing the flow of the ditch, backing things up. Um, we're going to replace that culvert under, in, in County Road 55 here um, this spring. So. There was a request to have the uh, ditch cleaned out, and it was a good time to do it uh, before we did the road project, uh, get the water down, get it cleaned up. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to install a culvert when you're not dealing with so much water. Uh, and it also makes a significant cost savings as far as the, the contractor putting in a bid because dewatering can be very expensive and, and can delay things progressively. Got everything cut down, um, piled it up. Thought about just having a big burn pile, but there's too many houses around there and it's, it's, people don't really care for it anymore. So brought in a chipper and chipped it all, uh, left it all on site. Um, in the easement of the ditch and outside of the ditch, the landowner actually wanted the chips. He's gonna use them for some landscaping projects. So we left them there, spread them out in some areas, uh, but about a half a day's worth of chipping and it was, was all cleaned up. Ditch 15, Haven Township. There was about 150 feet of ditch that couldn't be cleaned in December because the water was so high and it was an area where there was really no bottom. Uh, the machine almost was stuck and he bypassed that area. There wasn't a natural channel that went around it and was draining the water. But after cleaning it out, um, it dropped the water significantly throughout that area, about two feet. Uh, here he is in there too, around this area, recleaning um, the portion that wasn't dug out to the width and depth of the uh, rest of the ditch. As you can see, even, even this incredible machine um, was sinking down pretty far. It wouldn't, it wouldn't. Um, Mr. It wouldn't, Chair? Yes. Can you see Sorry this? Sorry to bother you again, but we're not seeing anything on the screen. Thanks for telling us. Well, we're going to uh, try to refresh again. Thank you. I mean, I have all the maps and things, but I have a feeling you're showing some great pictures. You're oh, missing. There we go. There you go. You were missing it. <laughs> we Thanks for letting it us all. know. Thank you. Would you like me to back up? Please. Okay. Okay. Have you seen these pictures? Wow. All the brush and no. trees. Okay. Uh, ditch 13, uh, the east end down by uh, Elk Lake where the uh, ditch outlets. A um, lot, of, lot of deadfall, a lot of obstruction in the ditch. Um, we're, you heard the part about we're cleaning out County Road, or replacing the culvert in County Road 55 this spring. Um, get the water down and get the ditch cleaned up uh, so we don't have to contend with all the water. It was a good time to get this done. It's been pretty overgrown, overdue. Uh, so the brush piled up, pushed towards the uh, driveway. Uh, we were going to, uh, thought about doing a burn pile and just burn it at all, but there's so many houses around the area that we figured we better not do that. Um, people don't really care for that anymore. Dealing with all the smoke and it makes their, it gets into their homes and it's just not a good situation. So we decided the best thing to do was just chip it all. I brought in a chipper and loaded it into the chipper and left the material on site. 
spread some of it along the ditch easement and uh, left some piles for the landowner. He, he requested to have some of the chips for, for landscaping projects or whatever he wanted to do with it. So we left it there for him rather than hauling it away, which is an added expense that wasn't necessary. Uh, ditch 15. We were able to go in and clean the 150 feet or so that we couldn't clean in December. Uh, it was just the water was too high and too wet. And um, there was a natural channel that was draining some of the water out of there. But it was best to go in there before they hauled out the machine um, and clean up the rest of the ditch. Uh, here's that backhoe with the pontoons on it. Even this machine is, is capable of getting stuck. It wouldn't sink, but it, it, gets, it does get stuck if, if it sinks down too far in the mud. Uh, the track system, it, just, it would just sit there and spin. So even this spring, it was still uh, touch and go, but we did manage to get the rest of the, the ditch cleaned out. And while he was down there opening up the rest of that 150 feet, um, he cleaned out and recleaned uh, the ditch on, on his way to the north end. So actually, the ditch was cleaned out twice. In December, there was probably two feet of water in here, foot and a half to two feet of water in here. And you can see it's pretty much down to the ditch bottom now. It made a big difference in the area. The landowners are, are very pleased. Even the, uh, there's a section corner, property corner, that is in the middle of the ditch that was able to be saved. Um, that's all I have for my ditch report. If you have any just, questions or comments. Well, just a comment on, on, on ditch 15. Uh, will you continue to monitor that? Uh, I mean, we, it was with a great deal of effort on a lot of people's part in order to get that ditch clean. And that has been going on for years. Uh, and, and it's the first time that's been accomplished in recent history. Uh, so by recent history, I mean the last 50 years, OK? So uh, I think we should monitor that closely, understand the success of bringing in that amphibious uh, backhoe to uh, dig that out, and kind of, I don't know how we do it, but I w we probably need to learn if that's a bog that's going to just float back in again, or if that ditch is going to remain open, and if it's viable for that to be continue to be maintained and what we need to do there because it was it I, I, I think you're covering up the gray hair but I see a little here and there Mike so I, <laughs> I'm sure that uh, you know it it was a, it was a very difficult project to get yeah. done and appreciate getting it done it's 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 a big deal for those landowners and we should monitor it closely now that we've invested all this getting it done yep I agree it was a trying time very uh, difficult at times, um, getting the permits, getting being allowed to be able to do it was even a feat in itself. And now that we have it done, I think uh, the next time it should be a slam dunk. It should be a lot easier. Good. Especially if we don't wait 50 years. Right, right. <laughs> well, before, I, uh, before I'm done here at Sherburne County, I'll, I'll see that it's done at least one more time. All right. <coughs> Okay. Thank you. And the other item is a, uh, I believe I saw a permit in here for a culvert. Board Chair, uh, we need to approve we, the agenda. Yeah, when you when you take on item three, which is to approve okay, a private crossing. Okay, I missed it here. I'm looking at the. Uh, yeah. The other. So item. Oh, four. okay. Item three here. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. But as part of that motion. Motion to approve uh, private. Crossing over County Ditch 34. Okay, Mike, if you want to. Would you, um, Mr. Chair, would you be willing to approve the agenda first, just for the record? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of the agenda, proposed agenda. Motion. Do we have a second out there? Is there. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Okay, we'll do a roll call. 
Uh, Commissioner Danielski. She said I, but she was muted still. Okay. Com Commissioner Barrett. Aye. Commissioner Foby. Aye. Commissioner Dolan. Aye. Commissioner Schmazing votes aye. The agenda is passed. <laughs> now that we're halfway through it. Okay, now we'll move on to the uh, culprit. Um, the landowner, unbeknownst to himself, installed a, a bridge over the county ditch. Uh, it was brought to our attention by planning and zoning. Um, he was unaware that it needed uh, approval from the ditch authority to have a crossing of the county ditch. Um, there was two courses of action that could have taken place here, is um, making the landowner remove the bridge, uh, which I didn't think was, was necessary. And second, uh, go through the process of, after the fact of getting the crossing approved. I've been out there and seen this bridge myself. It is probably one of the nicest crossings I've seen over a county ditch. Uh, it's made from a prefabricated concrete wall that you would see on a structural building or in a warehouse type building. Uh, it's very well built. It is not impeding the flow of the ditch. Um, so I, I felt it was the right thing to do just is leave it in place because I'm sure it was a significant effort could, to get that installed. So my recommendation um, is to approve the crossing. Is there a motion to approve this uh, crossing? So moved. Moved by Commissioner Dolan. Is there a second? I'll second. This is Brandt. Seconded by Commissioner Brandt. Any further discussion? Quick question, Mr. Chair. Question? Um, Commissioner Dolan. I didn't, shame on me, I didn't read through that agreement, but I'd imagine that he understands that 50 years from now or yep. 30 years from now, if there's any clean out efforts and that needs to get impacted, that's his liability versus our liability, yep. correct? Yeah, correct. I should have brought that. Um, I made it, the uh, landowner well aware that he's responsible for any maintenance of, of the crossing and um, any, any future maintenance around the crossing um, that he needs to do would be on his, his, his dollar. Okay. And he, um, he he's agree in agreement with that. Okay. Just double checking. Yep. Okay. Do we have a we have a motion and a second? We'll do the roll call. If there's no further questions, Commissioner Danielski votes. You were muted, uh, Commissioner Danielski. Aye. Commissioner Danielski votes aye. Commissioner Barrett. Aye. Commissioner Brandt votes aye. Commissioner Foby. Aye. Commissioner Foby votes aye. Commissioner Dolan. Aye. Schmeezing votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, let's see. Does Thank you. End? Thank you. Is that the end of our agenda here? Yes, okay, sir. thank you. Yes, our agenda is complete. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Just one note for those of you that are online here, if you can hear me yet. When you mute your mics, I can see that. So as we... If